Namaste. The other day, somebody accused me of being a Shaivite. <laughs> I am not a Shaivite. Just like when I was in Sri Lanka wearing Buddhist robes and living in a Buddhist monastery, I wasn't a Buddhist. Just like when I was growing up in my parents' home in New Jersey and going to Christian church, I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> what was I? I was always just who I am now, the self, covered by various layers of crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way I look at it now, it's like <clears throat> consciousness or awareness is like, you know, you're looking at a screen, right? You're looking at a screen right now. And most likely it's an LCD screen, which means it has a backlight. It has a backlight and then it has a film in front of that with all these little, you know, gizmos that turn on and off and become transparent or opaque at different colors, different wavelengths. That's all. Huh? And the whole shebang reconstructs a picture of a certain view which was recorded earlier, isn't it? So similarly, <laughs> in my experience, the mind is like this LCD screen that turns on and off these pixels in different frequencies related to consciousness. With three, there are three main stages of consciousness, huh? waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, just like there are three primary colors. <laughs> and then all the degrees of transparency or opacity. Isn't it? So that's what it's like for me. I am the backlight. I am the light. I am the projector. The projector. Oops. I am the light. And then my mind are all these figures, huh? like marionettes, dancing in front of me. All these different thoughts and stuff that actually that cover the light, that absorb and obscure the light. Huh? But I'm not looking at that. Huh? That's in my, usually in my subconscious, unless I do some special work to make it explicit. What, I'm, what people are usually looking at is, is not the light <laughs> and not, not the puppets of the mind, but the projection, the shadow on the screen. See, the shadow on the screen is what most people consider reality, but it's not reality because it's always changing. Huh? The shadows are always dancing around and things keep changing and you can never quite pin it down. But the one thing that never changes is the consciousness behind it. Just like the, the laptop screen, the backlight is always on. Even when the screen is completely black, huh? as long as the computer is turned on and awake, huh? the, the backlight is on. But if the screen is completely opaque, like it is during deep sleep, you won't see anything. <laughs> but then there's a fourth state of consciousness beyond that, which is actually the root or the connection of all three of the other states of consciousness. And that's called Turiya or the fourth. Now, similarly, <laughs> to get back to our uh, misunderstood diagram, um, the feedback I'm getting is that, like, nobody got it. Okay. So what are we talking about? We're talking about these four levels of Vedic teaching, and they're f speaking to four different audiences. And those audiences are, guess what? The people who are operating primarily through their waking consciousness, identified with a physical body and identity and actions and karma and all that stuff. Then there are the people who are acting primarily uh, through the subtle body, through thought and energy, right? And their status is higher. They actually have some connection with God. 
although that connection in the beginning is only intellectual or symbolic, as in the case of temple worship or something, something like that, chanting mantras and so on. At least, you know, there's some connection. It's not just gross sense consciousness, right? And then higher than that are the people who actually understand how it all works. Huh? They've read the Vedanta. They've gone all the way through and gotten to the, the punchline at the end. <laughs> oh, by the way, guess what? The world's not real. <laughs> okay, so what is real? Brahman. Brahman is real. Brahma Satyam Jagat Nishtya. That's Shankaracharya's uh, Mahavakya famous saying. That Brahman is real, Sat, eternal, always existing, ever existing. And all this other stuff <laughs> is mitya, it's illusion, it's just, you know, vaporware, man. <laughs> but consciousness is not going away ever. Because the whole play, the whole manifestation takes place within consciousness. Even the concept of God exists within consciousness, within thought, see, within you. So if you don't want to take responsibility for creating the cos cosmic manifestation, I mean, you know, <laughs> I can understand. It's, uh, you know, it's got a lot of kinks to it. A lot of people don't like it. <laughs> they struggle against it and therefore they suffer. But we should understand that this creation is made by a higher intelligence and it is the way it is for a reason. And what is the reason? To push us towards self-realization. And when we get that, we shift from being driven by external structures like religions and gurus and sanghas and, you know, cultures and whatever. Huh? We become independent. We manifest our native state, our uh, independent, what do I want to say, self-responsibility, our intention, overrides all other influences on our thinking and behavior. And so what that leads to eventually is self-realization. Uh, but that is beyond the mind and cannot be done with any kind of thought or physical action. And it does not rely on the abstractions of the mind, reason and thought and so on. And that's the next higher stage. What is it? Vivarta. Vivarta is, okay, let's sit down and do this. Like the Buddha said, do what has to be done. What has to be done? The mind has to be silenced. How do you silence the mind? Become absorbed in the light. What is the light? <laughs> the light is Brahman. The light is God. So become absorbed in God and then realize that God is within you. It's your light. Huh? You're only seeing the reflection of it on the screen of the so-called mind. Uh, just a, a thought. But because the mind has been purified by thoughts of God, then it reflects a true picture of who you really are, which is light. Oh, and I read an interesting article the other day that uh, from a physicist, that from light's point of view, because light, after all, travels at the speed of light, there is no time. Light exists in eternity and you are the light so when you reach that stage that's ajatta <laughs> ajatta vada huh? so we can talk we can discuss philosophy uh, on different levels depending on our state of mental advancement our, our state of mental uh, development or evolution so on the lowest level, uh, Pashu, there is no religion. <laughs> there is no, <laughs> no understanding. They're just like animals. 
But then in Dvaita, people develop an attachment for some kind of view, although it's a dualistic view, it does contain the concept of the absolute. And although they may be very pedantic and dogmatic and didactic, <laughs> uh, at least they're trying to do something. And then in the Vishishta Dvaita level, uh, people develop actually love for God. Uh, in the beginning, it may be fear of God, but uh, it matures into love of God, where God is seen as the, the projection of the ideal uh, ego uh, of uh, our uh, highest concept of selfhood. So the self, I mean, the egohood, e you know, self with a lowercase s. <laughs> Then in the next stage, one sees beyond that, oh, actually, if all this is going on in me and I'm experiencing the presence of God and even the form of God and pastimes with God and so on and so on, within myself, within my own mind, wait a minute, that means God is within me. I contain God and the whole universe because the whole thing shows up in my consciousness. So how big is my consciousness? My God, how big is my space? So then you go into Raja Yoga. And the best example I have now is the Buddha's teaching, which is that you meditate basically on nothingness, emptiness, until you have such a big space that the whole cosmic manifestation shrinks to a tiny dot and it disappears. And then you discover the real self. <laughs> this is an experience. And what happens is you get into this space, you clean everything out, neti neti, not this, not that, not the other thing, nothing, nothing that comes up, nothing that I experience, nothing that I can perceive is real. It's all coming and going. It's all just a, an apparition, an illusion. Uh, it's temporary, so I can't rely on it. Forget it. So one becomes increasingly absorbed in just nothingness, emptiness, uh, the beyond, you know, and trying to find a space that's so big that everything disappears. And then what happens? Well, guess who shows up? Brahman. <laughs> the light delight and the incredible bliss and all this that goes with it the knowledge everything so spontaneously you reach the same realization that the yogis try uh, for many lifetimes maybe you know to get by the exercise of will it just happens spontaneously when you prepare the mind by emptying it of all thoughts this is what Ramana is trying to tell us again and again. Huh? This is what Periyava is trying to tell us again and again and again. Huh? And so our work, if any, in the world should only be to prepare conditions so that we can do this work, this sadhana, and do what has to be done, and quiet the mind, and go within, and go into emptiness and find light, or the light will find you. <laughs> the light will pop out of nothing. Why? Because you are the light. You can't lose it. Just like you can't lose your shadow, you know? It'll follow you everywhere. Even into the, the, the hearts of the darkness of space. Okay? So, if that's so, then it must be an intrinsic attribute of our self with a capital S. What... Uh, we would say is not separable and inseparable from our being. So that means there's one more step. One more step. Now that you can be aware that, that you are everything and everything is consciousness only, then the only thing to be aware of in that state is the self itself. One self. <laughs>
<laughs> this is a jetta. See, it doesn't make any sense logically to talk about it. It leads to a logical singularity, conundrum, which cannot be resolved, a circular thinking. So uh, that means it's like a black hole. It, it sucks up every idea in its vicinity and just turns it into a merry-go-round of circular arguments. <laughs> So logic cannot comprehend this state, but practice can. And that's why I'm broadcasting now these uh, sitting videos, um, because they, they reflect the actual reality. I have to come way down. I have to come down into, uh, what is this? Vivartavada. Vivartavada. This was the platform on which Ramana Maharshi gave his teachings or even further to Vishishta Dvaitavada, which is what Pariyava used to give his teachings. But all those teachings led ultimately to the same goal of Ajatta, which both of them uh, exemplified in their own lives. Uh, and uh, I may have just found another one, a contemporary uh, Swami who is manifesting that reality too. So they're around, folks, you know, there have been human beings within our lifetime, within our memory, who have realized all these things, you know. So what's missing only is our persistence, our ability or our willingness to get out there and do what has to be done. So uh, I hope this clears up any confusion about the chart. <laughs> if not, drop me a line or make a comment and I'll try to address it. Om Tatsat, Om Harihi Om.